You may not know Tyler Dank's name yet, but you will. He looks like a pretty normal 20-something kid who came from a middle-class neighborhood in Maryland. Now he lives in California. He's hungry with ambition. And he's got that look in his eyes. You know, the eye of the tiger, whatever you want to call it. We've all had it when we thought we had the world in the palm of our hands. He's building what some might call a boring business. A SaaS product called Beehive for people who write and email newsletters. The thing is, newsletters are only boring if you suck at writing them. And there's millions of dollars to be made from them, with case studies like Alex Lieberman and Austin Reef's Morning Brew that sold for $75 million, where actually Tyler wrote most of the early code. There's The Hustle, which Sam Parr sold for $25 million to HubSpot, and many others. Tyler is self-made, and he's anything but ordinary. If you're into music, you might know him from his world-famous Big Desk Energy playlist on Spotify. After Morning Brew, he did a season at YouTube Music and really got an inside look at the music industry. He's also a very talented curator. That year, 2020, he got COVID and had to cancel a much-needed vacation to San Diego. Instead, he was trapped in his New York apartment and decided to build what might be the world's most intuitive and effective SaaS product for great writers who want to build an audience via an amazing newsletter. If you know, you know... Enjoy this masterclass of newsletter marketing with Tyler Dank. Here we go. I say it as luck, but there was no it not working, right? Like if if and when that road bump came, there were, had to be a way to keep moving because I couldn't possibly go back to Austin and Alex. Because again, like I'm young and impressionable and like this is my first job and be like, if I'm doing the math, you just paid me 15K for the past two months and I just did wasted all of your time because there's no workable product, which isn't possible yeah. or like reasonable yeah. so it's like we're just going to figure this out one way or another but i've also what i've learned from this experience is also like how i lead now and the type of people i look out for i care a lot less about where you went to school what jobs you had what titles you had previously i love young or old but t- typically they skew younger of just grit and like a passion i'll over index on passion and like a desire to be like i love beehive i've followed what you've done i see the vision of what you're doing I don't, I've never worked in a company like this or I haven't done this, but I know that I can make this work. And I'll bet on those types of people who can show that they're willing to watch every YouTube tutorial on how to be the best Facebook ad manager user of all time. Cause a lot of these skills are teachable. What you can't teach is like the drive. This episode is brought to you by WeWork. Don't just work from anywhere. Your working week deserves a little luxury, like beautiful spaces to spark ideas in person. Designed carefully for collaboration and peaceful nooks with uh, focus mode and awesome Wi-Fi. I love WeWork because I'm surrounded by like-minded people. It's a great place to hang out, network, or make good friends. They're even dog-friendly. Whether you're a solo entrepreneur or you bring your entire team, yes, your entire team, uh, there's a place and a space for you at WeWork. Are you inspired by where you work? Check out WeWork. Because now you can unlock productive, flexible workspaces in over 180 locations near you, especially if you use the WeWork All Access Basic. Get 30% off your first five months by using code Brian A A30. That's B R Y A N A A30. Or to redeem the offer, just go to we.co forward slash behind the brand. This episode is brought to you by my brand new, absolutely free VIP list. Want to get a short note from me each week with what I've learned from interviewing some of the smartest people in the world, the best inspiration, education, access to my private events, special perks, unique finds, free stuff, and a lot more to help you improve your life and business. Get on the list. Just go to behindthebrand.tv forward slash VIP. It's an email newsletter. It's as easy as that. One, two, three, VIP, behindthebrand.tv forward slash VIP and get on the list. My name is Tyler Dank. I'm co-founder, CEO of Beehive, and we are on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. What's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the show. Tyler, welcome. Thanks for having me. I usually ask my guests, how did you get this job? This job or, yeah, uh, by accident, really. Um, But I feel like that's how a lot of startups kind of start up, right? Find a problem, start building, and before you know it, you're on Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. (laughs) So break it down for me. Let's unpack it a little bit. How did you get here? What's, What's the deal? 
Yeah. So I guess depending on how far you want me to go back here, started a company in college, basically self-taught software developer, identified a problem on college campuses, taught myself how to code and build this startup. Didn't go on to become a multi-billion dollar startup, but really taught me a lot about entrepreneurship and the grit to kind of build something from scratch. Yeah. Where'd you go to school? Was it back east? Uh, yeah, back east. So University of Maryland. Yeah. And that's where you're from? Yeah. From Baltimore, Maryland, okay. uh, the, the suburbs, and went to University of Maryland, did mechanical engineering, technology entrepreneurship minor, um, and really got plugged into the startup and entrepreneurship scene there. They have an incredible program. A lot of amazing computer science students as well. So there was like a tech hub feel right outside of Washington, D.C. And so we identified a problem trying to connect business people and entrepreneurs to startups or to software developers on campus. So we kind of built that up. I sacrificed my weekends. We would drive to university hackathons at Harvard, Toronto, University of Michigan, sleep on the auditorium floors, trying to get signups because our core user was a software developer student. And did that for quite a bit of time. And once that ended up not being a smashing success, I was in the classic scenario of in my parents' basement, post-grad, making no money. I sacrificed a lot of summers instead of getting a traditional internship. I just worked on my startup thinking like this was the big thing. I remember looking around at all of the other students in my engineering classes that were dressing up in suits, trying to get jobs at like all these Northrop Grumman and engineering type jobs in like the DC area. Yeah. And I was like, these guys are such losers. Like I'm going to this like <laughs> massive startup. Like I, I know it's right there and look at fast forward a few months or a few years, ended up not going anywhere with my startup and ending up in my parents' basement with basically no money. Um, at the time I became like very fascinated with Shopify and I thought it was such a powerful platform. And there was all of these businesses just starting to come online and, and find ways to get in front of their audience so I ended up doing a lot of freelance work, building Shopify sites. And my good buddy, Austin Reef, who's also from Baltimore, co-founder oh, of Morning okay. Brew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just remember driving home from D.C. one day and he was talking about Barstool makes so much of their money and revenue from merchandise and sales. Morning Brew has like this like passionate fan base. It'd be really interesting to do some sort of like merch with them. And I was like, oh, that's perfect. I love Shopify sites. Like, let me spin up a Shopify site for Morning Brew. Yeah. And I was that, just talking to Harley Finkelstein this morning, actually, from he's the CEO of uh, Shopify. We we're just chatting about some stuff. He's got a new AI product out. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so do we, as of yesterday. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, it, it was just like this long hour and a half drive. Like me and Austin, we went to Israel together. We've had like a bunch of we've, we've always been very entrepreneurial and talking about different ideas. You went to Israel? It was like a birthright trip or something? Uh, we did like a summer internship program while we were in college. Okay. And so we lived in Tel Aviv. And wow, yeah. it was just funny, like back then. Austin was starting this thing called Morning Brew. It was an email newsletter. Yeah. And I was working on my like tech startup. And I was like, this I was like, this idea is so stupid. It's just like an email kind newsletter. Kind of a big deal. Yeah. He was just like, well, at, at the time they were known. They were they were college students at the University of Michigan. Yeah. And he's like, Yeah, we're sending out this email like a few times, like once a day. It's yeah. like business news. And I was like, I'm building like hard tech. Like I'm we're doing a two-sided marketplace. And I was so excited about my idea. And I thought Morning Brew was like cool, but I was like, you know, it's just an email. Yeah. Which I mean, is, that's also kind of like very like 2002, right? Yeah, yeah like no. it, was funny. Newsletter. it was funny, the dynamic, because like when you fast forward, one, now I built a company around email newsletters and worked at Morning Brew. Yeah. And so he ended up hiring me. But it's just funny, back on the beaches of Tel Aviv, we were just like talking business ideas and strategy. And I was like, yeah, I think we're going to these like college campuses to recruit software developers. And then we have network effects. And he's like, yeah, we're just sending emails like once a day. <laughs> um, so it comes full circle. But yeah, we were, we've always been very entrepreneurial and just kind of like talking about different business ideas. And so at the time, 2017, the skim was growing in popularity. Uh, Axios launched and was a big deal in like the newsletter space. And Austin came to me and was like, all of these newsletters have a referral program. They have an easy way to share on Twitter, or on Facebook, on LinkedIn. We have none of that. We have three people and like an office in NYU campus. And do you want to like help us build any of this? And so I'm at my parents' house in the basement with like, actually, I think like I have a screenshot on my phone of like $2 and 50 cents in my bank account. Yeah, it's awesome. And he's like, for like $3,000, you think you could build like this social share feature? Like, do you know how to do that? And the answer was no, but I had no money. And I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. I'll figure I got that this. out. Yeah. <laughs> and so I spent three weeks trying to build the ability to share your stories, these like individual stories on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, 
um, pretty common now in the newsletter space, but they were on some like janky Squarespace site and like sending copy and pasting through MailChimp. Like I didn't build, I was inheriting this tech that they had like some college students scrap together. Yeah. The amount of times I almost quit in those three weeks, because it would be 2 a.m. And I lied about knowing what I was doing. Yeah. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to be able to figure this out. I just kept hitting roadblocks. Um, Let but me it, just say, uh, that is, I guess, one of the signals that you might be an entrepreneur. If like you're super comfortable jumping off the cliff and figuring out how to build a parachute on the way down, like you probably got it. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of like built up experience of building from scratch with my startup that yeah. didn't succeed in college. And yeah. then there was the sobering realization that I was 22 in my parents' basement with $2 <laughs> in my bank account. Yeah. And like, I never wanted, I, I don't mean like I didn't mean to, didn't want to work at Morning Brew, but that was never the plan. I just needed money and yeah. I wanted to help out Austin. He was a good friend. It was like an interesting project. So I ended up spending three weeks, quit almost five times and eventually got the product out. It worked. And he goes, okay, well, now that you built that, we have this laundry list of like 20 things we've always wanted to do, but we don't have an engineer on our team. So while you're applying for jobs, yeah. why don't you just help us on contract? Yeah. So the summer of 2017 was me applying to tech companies where I was like underqualified because I was self-taught. So I kind of wanted software, but I was self-taught. So they didn't take a chance on me. Where were you applying? Um, like any big tech company. So, I mean, Shopify, Google, yeah. Facebook were like the, the home runs, but then yeah. like even like smaller startups that were just growing in popularity at the time and like more traditional consulting as well. I like didn't really have a niche. I had a lot of grit and I was really passionate about tech and building things. But on paper, I was a mechanical engineer who never did a mechanical engineering internship because mm -hmm. I was building startups in college. Yeah. And some, then I'm a software engineer, but didn't do computer science and never had a software engineering experience or internship as well. So I kind of didn't check any box fully outside of the fact that I was like really passionate and wanted to build. I'm curious, uh, what did your parents say? Because, you know, I'm surprised um, at the number of like high school students or college students who, who hit me up in the DMs or they leave comments and they're like, oh, this is so helpful. I, I listen to your guests and they talk about, you know, like how to find my path or whatever. Like, so what were your parents telling you at this point? Were they giving you good advice or bad advice? I, well, neither of my parents went to college okay. and I've always been very thankful that they've been overly supportive of everything that I've ever done. Yeah. So they're like, no problem. Come sleep on the back in your old bedroom. And I'm sure they got sick of me living at home at some yeah. point. Um, but they've always been supportive and like taken a back seat to whatever I was passionate about and supported me in what I've done. That's cool. And so like, I never had like parents that were doctors or lawyers being like, Hey, this is the way to go. Or like, this is what we want to see. I don't know if they had like expectations. It sounds weird saying that, but like, they weren't like, this is the path we want for you. Mm -hmm. You have brothers and sisters? I have a little brother. Okay. So you're the first. Partner. I'm the first one. Okay. They didn't go to college. They did like I led, I've been always very independent. So like I led the college application process. Yeah. I led where to go to school, how to get student loans, how yeah. to pay for college. I'm a firstborn too. So uh, I get it. Like there's something different about firstborns. Right? Yeah. I mean, and, but it's also like a new process, like this whole new, they, they grew up in Baltimore, went to high school. They both worked at social security, met each other, had kids. And like, that was like their life story up until me. And then the world is just so different. Like, so I was going to college, which they didn't know, like how to apply to college, yeah. how to do student loans, who finances that, what does college even look like? So they never had this trajectory or framework of what I should do or the steps to follow. It was kind of me leading the way the whole time. Yeah. And so that, not that I like surpassed them, but they, there wasn't like a playbook that they were pushing on me. It was whatever you think is right. Like we will support you. It's all new territory. Yeah. Right. So yeah. blazing new trails, which is, I feel like can go one of two different ways, right? It could be like, if I'm not as proactive and the way that I am, I could have gone down any not right path and like stumbled and without the direction of like my parents telling me what to do, could have gone a completely different direction. Yeah. Um, but surrounding myself with a like, good people, good friends. I've always been entrepreneurial and, and interested in building stuff. And so like found the right path, I believe. Yeah. 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 Um, so you had, you had all these applications out, nothing was hitting, you're getting frustrated. You got offered this sort of contract, uh, part-time gig possibly, you know, in it's an interim at, at best probably. And, and morning brew, like now I think most people are pretty familiar with it at the time they were sending emails to 50,000 people. Yeah. They were three guys out of a closet in NYU campus. And it was just a friend that I wanted to help out. And yeah. I was just building stuff because they had money to pay me while I was applying for jobs. Yeah. I mean, 
Tyler, I love this story so far. And it's like, these are the ones that start small and they turn into big things. There's this guy I knew. I read this story too, but I, I read his book. These two guys just started out of this garage and this one guy named Waz and this other guy named Steve. Just started I think I've heard that story. Computer, computer company. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like, they're just in, like, in their garage and like no big deal, kind of started this cool company. But like that's awesome. I love, I love the genesis of this. Well, I, my favorite word I tell everyone this and they make fun of me is like serendipity. Just because yeah. there's so many like chance events that happen in life that open one door and lead to something which leads to another thing. So stay on that for a second. So what is the key to serendipity? How do you make that happen? I'll say not where I am now, it's difficult because I also am very disciplined on focus. And so I say no to a lot of things, but I've also am only in this situation because I have happened to say yes to certain things that have opened the door elsewhere. So, okay, so well, let me ask you that then let's stay on that for a sec and I break that down. So how did you know what to say no to and what to say yes to? Because you said yes to the right thing. Well, I'd say earlier in my career, it was almost always yes to everything. Like if someone reached out on LinkedIn and yeah. was like, hey, do you want to chat? I'd be like, yeah, let's do it. Because like, you I had know. time and... I had time and like yeah. the trade-off at 21, 22 years old was like what doors exist, what relationships could I make and who could either instill more information or knowledge yeah. or lead to another introduction that gets me closer to where I want to be. Yeah. And so I was a total yes guy. And I'd say I'm in life and like my personal life, I'm still very much a yes guy. But you also like as the business matures and like where I am now, like saying no is actually like the power of being like, sure, I'm, this guy thinks that he can provide value to our business and like a consulting gig and it sounds good on paper. But like we we need to be hyper focused on executing. Yeah, and a lot of yeses are distractions in the business world, depending on where you are. Yeah, it's good advice. I just talked to um, do you know the Viore brand? Yeah, yeah. So I talked to Joe Kudla, who you know founded Viore. He said the exact same thing. Like they got hyper focused. They started with shorts, and that was all they did was shorts for a while, and they did that for three years until they got that right. So I think you're in good company there. And so okay, so you said yes. Uh, you were desperate at some point because, you know, you're back on your parents' couch. You had a couple of bucks in the bank account. Yeah. So there's that. But then, so what's your advice now about, um, you know, you're hyper-focused, but how do you choose, like, is it like a spidey sense or like, is it like how someone looks on paper? How do you make those decisions? How to say yes? A lot of it becomes from like warm introductions. And so if the person introducing someone yeah. is someone that I trust, then I'll take that call more often than not. Although yes. we do have a lot of VCs who are like, hey, this other portfolio company was interested or they think they could add X, Y, Z feature to you. And I was like, hey, we already have like a pretty stacked roadmap. Like we're title and bandwidth. The thought of adding some other third party integration because it might because they're in your portfolio honestly yeah. doesn't really make sense for us. Yeah. And so I, I tell a lot of our VCs like, no, like I, I'm sure this person's great and like maybe a great entrepreneur. But I mean, it sounds dumb, but like when I'm working 16 hours a day, like People like, you can't make 15 minutes for this person. I was like, it's just a trade off and we're super focused. Yeah. And I don't even want to like put in the 15 minutes. Maybe actually I like the person a lot and think maybe there is a synergy, but in the grand scheme of things, that's probably a distraction. So being hyper focused is something again, like I used to be honored when I was 22 and someone DM me like, Hey, do you want to chat for 30 minutes? Cause I was like, what could this possibly lead to? Yeah. It could be a job. It could be an opportunity. It could be a consulting gig. And I like to give back and like, I'm happy to do stuff like this, like a podcast or take calls to people who come in recommended. But I, I mean, I'm also in the hustle of like an early stage startup or 20 months old and still everything feels so fragile. Yeah. And if yeah. I feel like if I'm not 110% focused, then I'm just missing out opportunities to execute better. Yeah. If I'm being honest, Tyler, I still struggle with this. You know, I have a little bit more work experience now than I used to have. I still struggle with this. Uh, can I tell you two quick stories? Yeah, please. Um, one is, and, and they're sort of back to back in my early career. So let's flash back to me in college. And I was working my way through college. Um, I worked retail <laughs> of all places at uh, Ralph Lauren. Nice. I worked retail. I was selling like $800 uh, suits, uh, $350 uh, handmade English cap toe and wing tips and like $55 polo shirts, right? And there was this guy who came into the shop a lot, this young guy. Um, he was probably about my same age. And he would buy stacks of shirts, like small, medium, large, and double extra large, and take them out by the stack. And I'm like, huh, this is curious. His name was Sean. I'm like, Sean, 
what are you doing, bro? Like I was making commission off all the sales. So it was great for yeah, me. But sure. so you take these stacks of shirts and like eventually I, I, I was like, what are you doing, bro? He's like, well, uh, actually I got this little surfboard company and a little t-shirt company and uh, I'm taking these shirts to my pattern maker and I'm going to like reverse engineer these and like do my own activewear line. I'm like, oh, that's cool. And I like, I had this feeling like I could have asked him like, Hey, we should go surfing sometime. Like I, I, I hang out at Newport beach, like in my off time before work or after work, I'm like at 32nd street, like all the time. And I've mean, never seen you around Newport, but like, I knew that's where he was doing his thing. Uh, or I could have been like, Hey, that, that sounds cool. Like, like, can I shout to you sometime? Cause like, I'm just working this job just to get a paycheck and it's paying pretty well, but it's like, I kind of want to do something more than work retail in the future. But I didn't because I didn't think it would add up to much. I just kind of fluffed it off. So about a year later, I found out um, this guy's last name is Stussy. It was Sean Stussy, uh, which had a big surf brand, you know, kind of a big hit in the mid to late 90s, branched off the East Coast, was worth about $30 million at some point. And I was just like, huh. Could have been his right-hand man. I could have been. Like, I, I don't know about that, but I'd be like, I could have been in on that. The second story is in that same polo store, it was sort of a magical time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was run by this venture company. It was, it was a licensed store. It was run by this uh, company out of Colorado, Colorado Springs, I think. And the dude is at the head, his name was Bill Merrickin. And Bill, like, you could just tell, like, this guy had it, right? It's sort of like when I met Gary Vee. He's like, oh, there's something special. I don't know exactly what it is. But so Bill was this kind of big, like, executive guy. And I was trying to send him ideas about how to improve the store. And he was really liking my hustle. I was young, dumb. You know, I didn't know anything, but like, I was really trying. And I think that he recognized my, my, my work ethic. And like, I had a little bit of an ambition. And, and so we worked a little bit together, you know, and he, he was maybe just like humoring me, but like, anyway, we had a good friendship going. I could have asked Bill, like, hey, can I come up to Colorado and kind of see how the back office works? I want to know more about you know, like venture capital, like investing and, and buying real estate and doing these license deals. Um, but I thought, nah, it's probably not going to add up to much. I'm going to do something else. So a year later after that, Bill exits the company and he goes back to Colorado to help his uh, daughter who was in school develop this little all-natural protein bar concept. Uh, it's called Lara Bar. And Lara Bar like sold to General Mills in 2008 for like 50, 60 million dollars. So I think the thing there though is that you were in a position where you knew that you wanted more, yeah. and were identifying people around you who were either further along in their career or doing yeah. something that was interesting to you, yeah. Which seems to me like the green flag of like why not reach out and see if you can get involved to like learn from those around you, yeah, who are doing something that is beyond where you currently are, and you know you're not in that final destination, yeah kind of where I am is kind of the flip, right? Like, so I'm running this company, I'm heads down building, and I'm always looking for opportunities of people who can help lift me or the company up. Yeah. But like, there, there's a lot of people that are, you just have to be very selective, I feel like, with your time. Yeah. Um, and that's the POV I wanted to hear from your vantage point right now where you are, because I think it's super interesting. You, you, you've had a little bit of success. Um, some might say you've had a tremendous amount of success in a short amount of time, but like, I'll bet... If I'm going to jump into your brain, you'd be like, oh, we haven't gotten started. Whoa, well, wait till you see what we have. Well, and that's like, I'd also say like we work, work 100% remote company. So I'm in my room most of the day. Okay. Like this, this is un not uncomfortable. It, uh, for me to be out on a Wednesday, like outside of the office, it takes a lot for me not to think of the emails I'm missing or like whatever else. Like we're fully heads down, just like grind. Yeah. yeah. I'm hoping that we're at a point with, especially with the series, a fundraising that we can hire a few people, delegate more tasks. And I can feel like I can step away for an hour without like the world being on fire. But like, I, I feel like the team still has that passion and drive of like the very early days when we had 25 customers, the tech is brand new. We don't know if it works hundred percent, but like they're hundred percent trusting us to run their business, to communicate with their audience and it can't not work. Yeah. And so I was always on edge of like, what if they go to send an email and something breaks? Like I need to be available because if I'm not and it doesn't go out, they're really pissed off. Yeah. And we only have 25 customers. So if one of 25 <laughs> is pissed off, that's, you know, it's a good percentage of our user base. Yeah. So I think we still have that hustle. We're just finally getting to the point where it's like, we're also very low price. It's like $99 a month for most of our users. And we're making about four or $500,000 a month now. 
And so some users are very annoying and very persistent <laughs> and email me daily all of their problems, what they want. Platform does this. Oh, this okay. other platform does that. It used to be my biggest stressor. I'd be like, oh, we're not living up to this person's expectation of the platform, yeah. which is also a great thing, right? Like it constantly pushed us to get better. But when it becomes that much of a headache and it's taking up like an hour of my time daily, the, we finally hit the point where I'm like $99 a month and we're making $500,000 a month. I'd actually rather you just one reset realign expectations like this is how it's going to be yeah we're working we're, we hear you i just can't respond and, and treat you like a vip yeah and if you choose to leave it's like i want you to stay but like no offense you're point zero 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 one percent of our revenue yeah and that feels really good to be in a position that we have kind of worked really hard to get up to that point yeah it's the point where you start delegating so let's go back to morning brew so you started doing contract stuff um, what happened from there? Yeah. So I was doing contract work for them again, like Austin's and Alex are incredibly smart. So they had a laundry list, the space of like email newsletters with the skim and Axios and the hustle were really heating up. Yeah. And so everyone was kind of doing referral programs. They were sharing, they're doing paid advertisements. And so long laundry list. I'm the only engineer. Again, I always have this chip on my shoulder too, like self-taught software developer. So I, even though like what I've learned with time is like in the computer science program classes, like you aren't really like learning how to build websites per se, or like doing a lot of the stuff you do in these roles. But I was always, I type something and it would work. And I was like, I don't know if that's the right way to do it. And it could be vulnerable. Like there, it might not be perfect. So I've always had that chip on my shoulder. Um, but I was building out stuff for them, turned into 40, 50, 60 hours a week, just building stuff for morning brew Yeah. while I was applying to different jobs, doing interviews, um, and I eventually got a job at Deloitte in a consult, like a tech consulting role, which is where a lot of people from the engineering school at Maryland, there's like all of the big four mm -hmm. and consulting firms in DC. It's a natural feeding ground. You graduate from Maryland, you go to DC and Arlington and you get like a consulting job. It's like also like seen as like pretty good. Like it's a good seventy five, eighty thousand dollars starting salary. Yeah. Right out of college. It's good on the resume. Great on the resume. Like no one complains that you had a nice like tech consulting job like out of college. Yeah. And so I had a girlfriend at the time. She lived in D.C. My best friend moved to D.C. It was like, it's a two bedroom. Let's move in together. And so my whole life has pushed me to D.C. I'm about to start. I think it's like September is like my first day. And Austin goes, do you want to join us full time at Morning Brew um, and just like continue doing what you're doing? But like, let's actually bring you in house. And I was like, I, I made him go through every stipulation of like, you know, we only have five hundred thousand dollars in the bank. We're still sending a very small operation, 50,000 email subscribers. Like what happens? Because there's the sure thing, which is Deloitte. Yeah. I have a ton of student debt, still do, but a ton of student debt. And so the sure thing is like, you know, get a job that's stable, has health insurance, 401k. Yeah, it's tempting. We'll, we'll pay your student debt. Yeah. Join a three-person startup in New York that's working out of NYU sending emails and 50, like a new 000, space. Yeah, 50,000 is not a big number. Yeah, it, not not at all. Yeah. And now where, where I am now, where I see these newsletters going from zero to 50,000 in like two months, it's like, yeah. that's all they were at the time. Yeah. And so, so one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten, like I was going back and forth for three weeks of like my, this is the first time my parents actually kind of stepped in and were like, you have a ton of student debt and they know like, if I'm not paying it, they're, they're going to have to potentially pitch in. So they're like, you know, DC is very close to home. Sure. Sure. Job where it's like very safe startup i don't even know what this means there's three people whatever and my friend goes you can go to deloitte and you're gonna be one of fifty thousand people doing that exact same job or you could go to morning brew and you're the only person in the world doing that and like yes. that resonated with me so much because i've always been someone to bet on myself that yeah and it made me more uncomfortable doing that and it was more of a risk but i've made every decision up in my life from like doing the startup in college I like took some research gig just because I thought it looked good on a resume in college. My senior year I had no idea what I was doing with these capacitors, but it was like a new challenge for me and I was totally underqualified, but I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. And so for better or worse, I've always put myself in the more stressful of the options when I have them where there's more unknowns, but more upside or like more personal development. And so, yeah, my friend told me that and I thought about it and I was like, worst case scenario, if it doesn't work out, I'll find a job somewhere else, yeah. but I'd much rather bet on myself and have my best friend or a good friend and his friends is like my boss and we're on this like cool thing the other thing that worked really well that helped me was when i was interning or on contract i had, they gave me full access to everything which is like the inbox the emails the tech and i saw the rabid fan base of readers who would respond to every email being like 
I can't start my day without Morning Brew. I love this. I've shared it with my entire class, with my friends. And it was having that insight and transparency to that, like, gave me more of a confidence boost in choosing that option because I felt like they were really on to something and resonating with a very target audience. And they were doing it with no growth strategy, no engineer, just like three people writing. And so it just seemed like a fun problem. And they're like, well, you, you want to be in New York in like two months? And I was like, <laughs> I guess I'm going to leave my friend back in D.C., move, leave my girlfriend, leave everything I had in D.C. and just go up to New York. Um, so that was kind of like how that started. Yeah. So when you said bet on yourself, I got the little goosebumps. That is it's so inspiring. It's so relatable because I've I did that, too. And so I can co-sign that, that that was like the best thing I ever did for myself is believe in myself, invest in myself, take a chance on myself. Um, I love that story, man. Awesome. Um, okay. And so what happened to Morning Brew then? So moved up to New York and it was awesome. Honestly, it, I was 22, 23 years old in a new city, New York. Amazing. Um, and like, Austin was my boss, but he was also a friend and he also brought me on because he trusted me. How old were you guys then? I think Austin might be a year younger than me. So I think he was maybe 22. Like he just, he also bet on himself, right? So I think he was working at Molus, like a big private equity or investment banking firm in New York. And he kept messaging me like every few months being like, I have an amazing investment banking job in New York that's paying well. Yeah. Amazing, not by what he was doing, but yeah. by pay and, yeah. you know, being 22 years old, making whatever that Relatively salary is. Relatively speaking, yeah. Great. And he's like, or we were sending this email and people like seemingly like it a lot. They're resonating. I think there's something there. Something's happening. Yeah. So he went through pro like, I mean, the 80K salary at Deloitte's cool. What he gave up at Mollus was definitely a lot more to go all in Morning Brew, but yeah. co-founder made that bet on himself. And so... He was probably 22 at this time, like just like a year out of Michigan. I was 23, came up to New York and it was just do whatever it takes to grow the newsletter. So the referral program was the first thing. It was the skim has a skim ambassador program. It's really interesting. People rave about it. They have a whole rewards incentive. Let's just copy that. But with our audience. So can we can we go slowly on that? Because we can also make this into like a little tutorial for I know there's a lot of people now who are using Beehive, but also maybe using other platforms about wanting to kind of know the the building blocks of how to build that audience and get it out there. So uh, for those who don't understand what the referral program does how it operates like break it down a little bit further yeah so up until this point morning brew was sending emails monday through friday it's funny it's witty it's conversational business news so their take was bloomberg and forbes or whatever like they present the news in a very like here's the facts type manner and morning brew is like let's break it down to more of a younger demographic adds it's like kind of like seinfeld meets like bloomberg in a way yeah and so that clearly resonated with people and people would respond like, this is hilarious. I love how you break down the news. I've never been a news person, but I love this. So now I'm sharing it with my classmates, with my friends, with my family. So is it just like a forward in the email, like a like total forward email? At the time, just like, forwarding yeah, so or just, just like a Nothing word of fancy. mouth. Hey, sign. I've been reading this newsletter. I think yeah. it's hilarious. Just sign up. And so when we would ask people how they found out about the newsletter, more often than not, they were like, oh, my friend showed it to me or yeah. my teacher recommended that all of the students in the class signed up because it's a great way to stay up to date with current events and different business news. And so that was the initial hunch that if people are doing it organically, they, they were getting nothing out of sharing it. with. Yeah, I was going to say, what were the incentives? Just they had like a very rudimentary referral program before we kind of came in and revamped it. But more or less like nothing. It was just like they found value in it and we're doing it almost altruistically just to share like also like, you know, uh, like social capital. Like, hey, I've been reading this. It's really cool. Yeah. This I, think you'd I think you'd benefit from this. Like some people at Michigan launched it. Yeah. It gives you kind of clout. Yeah. And, yeah. and they also like did it by law. They would go classroom to classroom at Michigan back when they were students and sign people up. So there was already like a concentration of people in Michigan reading the newsletter and then a lot of those people in the Michigan Business School went on to move to New York and get like their first like entry level job. So there was like small network effects there. But the whole basis of the referral program is if people are already taking interest in the content and sharing organically, 
what would it mean if you said, if you share with five people and we'll keep track of it, we'll give you stickers or we'll give you like an insider newsletter. Mm -hmm. Um, So we did something called light roast, which at like three referrals, you would get like an exclusive Sunday newsletter. So the marginal costs are zero. It's just like you write a newsletter to either one person or 10,000 people. It's the same work by the writer. Yeah. And we branded it as like an exclusive. We already know you like business news because you came to us and signed up in the first place. How would you like a weekend edition with more business news to get ahead in the week? Yeah. And just the target audience that we were going for resonated with that. Yeah. So you kind of gamified it and you put some incentives in there that would work. And then you had some sort of trackable source in there, like a, a pixel. Or yeah. So you can keep track of who's referring who. They can they can track their progress. They can see who they nudged and who actually signed up and who didn't and, and everything. So okay. that was like the basis of the referral program. Okay. And I'd say my first like year there was the way that. And like, maybe it's just me and how I think about focus even today, but Austin's like, just focus on things that are going to grow the audience size. So if it me if the website can be justified, like a brand new flashy website will actually increase conversion and get more people to sign up then do that. But don't waste three weeks building like night mode for the email. If that doesn't really move the needle, like people aren't like, yo, check out this night mode <laughs> newsletter. Mm-hmm. Like you should sign up. So we did referral program. We did like onboarding series. We revamped the website and started testing different headlines, phrases, just A-B testing everything on the landing page. Mm-hmm. Um, we did like the social share stuff, which was like kind of like my summer project when I was on contract. We built dashboards to understand where readers were coming from. Do you ever give stuff uh, stuff of significance away, like, you know, a, a prize or like this or that? Or did you ever do any kind of... So we, we, we got into giving away macbooks as like a thing so we would do like a referral challenge where everyone who if for every person you referred in a 24-hour period it would be like one raffle ticket yeah into this macbook giveaway okay and we would see sometimes like forty thousand signups in a 24-hour period this is later when we were already at like a mil mil and a half okay but forty thousand signups a day Mm -hmm. just from saying that you have a one in probably forty thousand chance of getting a macbook pro and so we did that once. That's crazy. Crazy. Well, and the reason I asked is because I, I knew that that gets people to jump through hoops because I think about Mr. Beast and, you know, like the opportunity, if he's holding a lot of cash, it's like, yeah, you're going to watch this video or you're going to subscribe because you hopefully are going to run into him like Willy Wonka. He's going to give you a golden ticket. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we, we experimented with everything. But what attracted me the most about this job was I was 23 I had a boss who is a friend and he, they fully trusted me to say like, we brought you on because we know that you have the same vision we do. You're smart. You'll make the right decision. I tell them like, I think I'm going to spend two months doing this. And they'd be like, that sounds good. And there wasn't like any other hoops to jump through. I was like yeah. kind of creating my own playbook of like my day to day. Yeah. You're like on the executive team. Like- and so I was like on the senior leadership team too. Mm-hmm. And when they started to legitimize and grow the business and bring in like actual like execs and I was still sitting there in the meetings, I was like, pretty awesome to be like 24 25 this time and yeah. like making like the hiring roadmap decisions and like the hr decisions of like how we're going to scale this company so that was awesome i mean a great example of like me kind of calling my own shot in a way was when i first joined we had a html template newsletter and the writers would actually copy and paste the title into the title spot mm-hmm. the text into the story spot right and they would do that for like two hours every day. So they would spend like six hours of their day writing the newsletter yeah, it's in clunky. Google Docs. Yeah. Then they would copy and paste it into this editor and they'd slack me towards the end of the day. Like, I think this is ready to go into like MailChimp. And if they accidentally deleted a comma or like an extra space, the whole thing gets messed up. And so yeah. then I spend two hours at like 10 o'clock at night debugging where the writer accidentally deleted something yeah formatting junk and and the amount of times we had to restart at like 10 11 o'clock at night because the newsletter has to go out and get set was non-negligible and once we pivoted from not pivoted but grew from a six-person team to like wanting to bring on more writer talent you can't get talented writers to join knowing that they're going to spend two hours a day copy and pasting into an html document yeah so it's ridiculous. The decision became clear. Like we need to build a solution or find a solution that helps send these newsletters. Yeah. And a lot of the CMSs and different platforms of the time are all web-based because there weren't like newsletter first companies. There was us, there was like the hustle, there was the skim and Axios. But most of the companies were blogs and media companies that were built on WordPress or whatever their own tech stack was. Yeah. And so me being naive and dumb and young and 23, I go. Let's just build our own CMS where like, I already know what the writers want. I know how they compile the newsletter. I know the constituent parts. 
give me three months and I'll just build this myself. And also just being so naive, I didn't map out like a PRD or like how I was going to build it. And so every day I'd wake up with the anxiety of like, this is like too good to be true. Like there has to be a road of roadblock at some point where I'm going to hit a point where I can't build any further. And I just totally overlooked. And so I woke up with that anxiety every day for three months and just kept building. And eventually like we had a CMS that was entirely custom built for us. Yeah. Neil, our managing editor, would go in. He'd like test it out. He'd copy and paste some stuff in. He'd move around the stories, and then it outputted like a perfect HTML email. I was like, "Holy shit! We just built our own CMS that's custom for Morning Brew. It has our styling now. Instead of Neil copy and pasting into HTML, he's like in a typical text editor. I pulled that out of my ass. Out of I have no idea how I figured out how to build that in three months by myself. And it was just such like a cool like. I went to Austin. I was like, I think we should build our own CMS. And he's like, okay, I think that makes sense. Yes, and I just spent three good. months doing it and then it worked. And then we had our own CMS and like would onboard new teammates. And like, as we hired from Vice, Vox, Condé Nast, whoever, they would come on and be like, this editor is better than the one I was using at Condé Nast. And I was like, that's so incredible that something I built without even knowing what I was doing. And again, like the chip on my shoulder, self-taught developer, now I'm building like production level software that a full team is using. And I'm 24. And then that's what I do half the day. And then the other half of the day, Austin's like, can we spend $500,000 this month on paid acquisition on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Snapchat? And as a small team, I was like, I- I'm creating in Photoshop the different assets. I'm going and learning how to use Facebook ad manager, how to use Google ad manager, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. Yeah. I'm tracking the pixels. I'm making sure they're signing up. I'm seeing the conversion and I'm spending $500,000 a month as a, again, like as a 24 year old yeah. with like no one telling me like not to, or like, this is like what we should be testing. Yeah. And it was that environment of just having full buy-in from my higher ups, Alex and Austin, for me taking complete ownership of like, I don't know what Facebook ad manager is, but I'm about to spend $300,000 on it. So I might as well watch yeah. YouTube videos and figure out how to be the best at that. And total, like, just no red tape at all, just figuring it out. I love this so much. Was was awesome. <laughs> I, I'm getting excited talking about it because, like, I don't know. I, I mean, even, like, we, we we give a lot of autonomy at Beehive now. And, like, we have interns and people coming on and we give them total access. But the thought of me just being that young and having – and, like, we were growing. We were scaling the team from 5 to 15. We were becoming, like, a media organization that people depended on. And it was all built on like tech that I kind of was like, I think we can just build this ourselves. Yeah. And it just worked was like an incredible learning experience for me and like just how the business world kind of worked. Uh, wow. There's uh, there's so many lessons there. Let me just extract a couple and just kind of restate for if you miss it, it was kind of subtle. But like sometimes not knowing everything is the best situation to be in, to be like totally green, newbie. Like, not know that what you're about to do is kind of insurmountable or never been done before or like super hard, but just be like, I don't know any better. So I'm just going to do it because that seems intuitive and the right decision to make. That's awesome. Um, And just the audacity in a good way to just like, despite. Maybe you felt like um, there's this uh, phrase called imposter syndrome, right? You get it when you're young, you get it when you're older, you can get it anytime. Um, But you just totally like put that to the side and you're like, well, seems like this is what we should do. This is what we need. This other system is clunky, ineffective. It's taking six hours to copy and paste. It's, it's BS. I've got a better way. And so you just, you just build it like pure ignorance of not knowing any yeah. better. And I also like, I didn't have a traditional internship or a corporate job. This was like my first ever job Yeah, and there was no strings. There was no red tape. It yeah, was like, Is this okay. If it, like you're looking around. It was such like, like Austin's like, we are a hundred thousand subscribers. Let's get to 200,000 as fast as possible. And I yeah. was like, how much money do I have? And what, are there, is there any restrictions? And he goes, just grow the newsletter. Yeah. You know what that is though, too. That's like to Austin's credit, that's vision. That's leadership. Right. Even, you know, again, maybe you didn't know any better, but like, that's the stuff right there. Cause like, I feel like, especially, I mean, Austin's very young at this time yeah. and to see what is traditionally done in a business with leaders, COOs who are running an org or a team, sometimes it's like heavy handed over indexing on reporting and numbers yeah. and report cards and estimates. 
And he, whether he meant to or not, was like, this is working. Let's just feed more of that yeah. and let Tyler run wild. Which like, so like for me to be in that situation, like it took the perfect mix of them having buy-in, them being distracted, doing other things, me being able to take a few bets and like them actually work out. I'm sure like if I spent three months on this text editor and it didn't work, then everything after I'd be like, hey, I think I need to spend three months building this. You'd be like, well, the last time we we just paid you 25% of your salary to build something that didn't work. Yeah. And it was a total waste of time. So there's like a lot of luck too and that things yeah. just happened to work out. And I think it just compounded with, we trusted him for two months to build this and it worked. Now he's making a case for X. Let's just double down and see what that does. Yeah. I, I buy that. I accept your luck thing. But like, what's that saying? Like, luck is where like opportunity and preparation, you know, intersect. Well, because I say it as luck, but there was no it not working, right? Like if if and when that road bump came, there had to be a way to keep moving because I couldn't possibly go back to Austin and Alex. Because again, like I'm young and impressionable and like this is my first job and be like, if I'm doing the math, you just paid me 15K for the past two months and I just did wasted all of your time because there's no workable product, which isn't possible, yeah. or like reasonable. Yeah. So I was like, we're just going to figure this out one way or another. But I've also, what I've learned from this experience is also like how I lead now and the type of people I look out for. I care a lot less about where you went to school, what jobs you had, what titles you had previously. I love young or old, but typically they skew younger of just grit and like a passion. I'll over index on passion and like a desire to be like, I love Beehive. I've followed what you've done. I see the vision of what you're doing. I don't, I've never worked in a company like this or I haven't done this, but I know that I can make this work. And I'll bet on those types of people who can show that they're willing to watch every YouTube tutorial on how to be the best Facebook ad manager user of all time. Because a lot of these skills are teachable. What you can't teach is like the drive. Yeah, it's all teach. It's all teachable. It's all learnable. Everything all is. All of it, yeah. So the the things, the hard skills to learn are actually what I care less about. Yeah. It's the underlying person who shows that they are like, not only will I work Saturdays and Sundays, but like I want to. Like I, I'm choosing to not go to the park on Saturday because I'm so interested in how this like Facebook and Google ad engine works. And I think that there's optimizations to be had that all these other companies are missing. And I want to figure that out. And because I see that in myself. And so that's, I think, why I'm biased towards hiring those types of people. Because going all the way back to earlier, I didn't check the boxes of like getting a software job. I didn't check the boxes getting a engineering job. I barely got a consulting job after like getting turned down by everyone else. And so I, I stumbled into a role where the only thing I had was the ability to try harder than everyone else and figure out how things work and how I could provide value. And those are the people that get me really excited to join the team. Yeah. People who can figure stuff out and just get the result. Let me ask you also too, is this like the best time or the worst time to get into starting a newsletter? Because I'm seeing newsletters pop up like crazy. You're right. After Morning Brew sold for what, 70 plus, thousand, uh, 70 plus million and The Hustle sold for uh, undisclosed 25 plus million as uh, Sam Parr talks about yeah. almost every single Undisclosed, episode. but in between these two numbers. <laughs> yeah. But he, he likes to drop that number all yeah. the time. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so good things are happening in that space still. But is it is it too late? Do we miss the boat? I don't think so. Because one of my favorite quotes is Ben Thompson saying that the internet is so much bigger than you think it is. And I don't do this anymore. This is like one of the unscalable things that we did at the early days. But I used to approve every sender on the platform before sending. And we would ask for their Twitter handle and LinkedIn just as like an anti-spam. Like, are they legit? Yeah. And they would, all, they would also, oh, so there's also a growth hack in that. I would follow them on Twitter and I would connect with them on LinkedIn. And I would do that for an hour and a half every single day, mm -hmm. which is just like a multiplier effect because then I'm very into like the build in public. We just launched these features. Here's how it works. I share on Twitter. I share on LinkedIn. Now the past 10,000 people that I've connected with on those platforms that followed me back see that. They feel invested in the journey because they signed up. They had a real connection with me because I reached out to them. And they see that we launched this feature. They like it. They retweet it. Now it's into their network. Yeah. So that was like one of those things that don't scale, like network effects early days um, is like a growth multiplier. Very but I say that because they would also provide a description of what their newsletter is going to be about. And you'd be so surprised by these like 10,000 person newsletters covering like uh, high school football in North Dakota <laughs> or like just very niche corners of the Internet of things that maybe don't interest me or I didn't know there was that big of a community. 
but there was like a massive 50,000 person list about X. And you would never think that X even had that many people, let alone like this one operator that you've never heard of. So I say that because the thing about newsletters is like, I think the circle that we live in on Twitter and LinkedIn, you see a lot more people because the people you're connected with, they're probably skewing a little bit more ambitious, starting their own projects. Emails are so cost effective that you can do it like one, one night a week and pay $0 in most cases and scale an audience. And so they're very time effective, very cost effective. And if you're around ambitious people who want to grow their influence and maybe have revenue streams, it is like a very low hanging fruit operation to explore. So long way of saying, I think a lot of newsletters are popping up, but I think there's an audience and room for all of them to succeed. Um, they just need to find their own niche and audience. Yeah. I, I see it like, like I see content, you know, like we have video cameras going, we have audio going. Um, I'm going to write, you know, something about this. So it's like, you need to go where the audience is. If you've got an audience who likes to read your newsletter, for example, that's just another platform opportunity for you to tell stories. Some people like to watch the video on YouTube. So we have something on YouTube for them. And some people like to listen, you know, while they're commuting or working out or doing their laundry, whatever. So we have an audio platform. Like we go to where the people are going. Yep. And I'm with you. Um, Email is still for us super viable. It's how we announce new podcasts. It's how we new, announce like events that we're doing. And, you know, we're getting, you know, 30 and 40% open rate. I would like a hundred percent open rate. Of but, course. You know, sometimes Google doesn't even deliver that email correctly. Yep. And there's a whole other conversation there with deliverability, but like, it's still super viable. Yeah. I mean, I, I am actually really bullish on brands and companies getting into the newsletter space because I think a lot of people go straight for the kill in sales of like the whole reason why I think a lot of organic content around courses are so effective is, for example, like the podcast I listen to and they're in my ear every day when they launch a product, I'm more inclined to explore that product because I've already built up some sort of reputation by listening to these people and hear how they think and their thoughts and, and what interests them. And if I keep coming back to their content, I'm clearly interested in what they have to say. Mm -hmm. And so podcasts are really effective in that manner. That's why I think all of the, whether it's the all in pod or pivot or um, my first million, when they do like a, in IRL event, they sell out because they have so many people that have been listening to them and they've built this habit and they build a personality around their media and their content. Yeah. Well, the, the newsletter is like a receipt. Right. And right? so, yeah, it's, it's hard to go back like, oh, the show notes, it's a pain, but like you, if you got an email. It's like, you, you already know how to track that and store that and organize that. It's already built in. Yeah. And Legacy. so I like, so podcasts are great. I think newsletters are great too, in the sense that it's like a funnel. It's the whole reason why I think the whole paid newsletter is very interesting as well, because rather than requiring payment up front for like an unproven product, why not send them your free news? Like I was on Ben Thompson's for Techery free for I think three years before I finally decided to pay $12 a month to get the premium. But like that's such an effective lever. Like I saw the value in what he was doing and it was free to me as the consumer. Yeah. I built up more and more interest and value perceived in what he was doing up until the point where I was like, okay, I think I'm ready to pay for this. And I think more brands can do that, whether you're a clothing brand. So we have Mad Happy. They send like a mental health newsletter. It's not shoving sales and clothes down people's throat. It's just brand awareness and creating content that they know their audience would be interested in. By the way, it's also presented by Mad Happy. Mm -hmm. And so it just builds like more of a brand allegiance that will eventually, hopefully, in their mind, lead to more sales. But I think that's such an effective strategy that very few companies use. And so I use that as an example as while newsletters are great for entrepreneurs and kind of like hobbyist projects, I think there's a lot of big brands that haven't experimented to the extent that they should with creating some sort of content and newsletter that does funnel into their core product. You're right. I can think of like, especially if you have like a, a company like Salesforce or, you know, like you have thousands and thousands. That's why HubSpot bought the hustle, right? It, it's, it's free advertisement yeah. to their core enterprise solution, but it's being told and presented by a brand that you know and trust and yeah. it's very habitual. You wake up every morning, you read the hustle, you listen to my first million pod brought to you by HubSpot and it all kind of funnels into if, if they can get 
a few sales a week off that, like an amazing ROI. Yeah, I was going to say too, and you can use that email newsletter as a as a platform, but also to ignite your internal people to be your evangelists, right? You don't have to, maybe there's a paid portion that you're trying to get people to pay attention to your brand, but it's like, hey, look inside first because you have all these little, uh, you know, evangelists working for you that will help spread the word internally. And, you know, that's a multiplier effect. Yeah, it's funny. When we were at Morning Brew, there was one time when we explored doing like internal comms for massive organizations as an opportunity to boost like employee retention, engagement, um, just because some of these companies are, I mean, I can never relate. I've never really worked at a large company, but like 50, 60,000 employees and being yeah. able to share what all the teams are working on big events, maybe even break it out by the New York office versus the LA office. Yeah. But email is such an effective medium for that, especially in the work setting where everyone's kind of attached to their email. Um, but yeah, I totally agree. So what else should we be, be doing to grow our newsletter? So there's organic, there's word of mouth, there's sharing. Hopefully it's good enough that people will share it with at least one or two friends. Um, what else should we be doing to build? Yeah. I mean, I think you hit on the core thing, which is like the content has to be great. And everyone always is looking for like the quick silver bullet of like, how do I go from starting my newsletter to 10,000 subscribers in like week one? And like, I guess you could dump a ton of paid money and spend into that and make that possible. But the reason why everything we did at Morning Brew worked was because the content was better than the other content that was out there. And if the content sucks, like, yes, you can pay. It's like the whole leaky bucket analogy, but like you can pay to get people in the funnel, but they're going to unsubscribe and churn as soon as they realize the content isn't providing any value for them. And so one is like really nailing down who are you writing for? What's the value prop? Is it better than what's out there? Whether you're making it funnier, more entertaining, more concise and bite size, or just you come from a background where you have deep industry expertise and can yeah. provide value. So content's always first and foremost. And it's not the sexiest thing to say of like how to grow your newsletter and people don't love hearing it. But if the content sucks, nothing else really works. Yeah. So really nailing that is is first and foremost. Let's drill down a little bit further on that. So is there a sweet spot for length? Uh, like back in the day for video, they, they would say, oh, Brian, you know, uh, nothing over three minutes. You know, no one's even going to pay attention. You know, everyone's got ADD. And I'm like, no, I think there's a place for longer form content as long as the content's good. Yep. Like, wouldn't you want to sit down with Tyler and listen to him take you to school on newsletters for like an hour instead of having him give you like two minute tip? Like, and more, there's room for both too, right? But yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. So like, so is there a sweet spot for writing? I think it depends on like what you're doing, right? Like yeah. Ben Thompson's for tech rescue is much longer and it's more of a deep dive into like a trend or story that's happening in tech. There's other ones that are more aggregation and just like short, quick form notes of here's what happened in crypto yesterday. Yeah. Here's what happened in AI yesterday. Yeah. So I think it depends on what your audience wants. I'd also say not being overly stubborn on what you think is best. But being super receptive to feedback, whether it's through polls or just reply to this email with what you think, or just ask, is this too long, too short, just right at the bottom of your emails? And we have like a polling feature built in. But I think that's one thing that we did really well at Morning Brew is Neil, the managing editor, was always very interested in how we could be making the product better. Because like he never got like the arrogance of like, we know we're the best daily business newsletter. So we're like, we're good. We know the equation. We know the formula. It's working. Let's not change it. He was always experimenting with new sections. He was always asking readers what section they liked the best, what they wanted more of, and adapted and tested that. Okay. So I'd say, while yes, you as the newsletter writer or operator have a vision for it, and you probably got it off the ground and achieved some level of success, being receptive to what your readers actually want to an extent. I think people always say that they want certain things too, and you actually may know better. And that's like another kind of like dichotomy of how do you know when to actually listen to reader feedback versus when do you actually know better? And I think the example here, I was just dealing with an email yesterday about it, is a lot like people want less email. A lot of people want less email in their inbox. And we would always hear at Morning Brew, except when we went to six days and then seven days, can we just get like a weekly roundup? And like people, and it's not uncommon for newsletters to have like, send me twice a week, three times a week, week daily, or just once a week um, and allow like users to choose the preference center for us, you know, we're an advertising based business. So it's advantageous for us to get as many impressions and us as in morning brew in this case, we wanted as many impressions as possible. So we are like, we don't really care. We, we hear you, but we don't care. We're sending you six days a week. And if that's too much. Think about email, just don't open it or delete it. But like no one's forcing you to, yeah, this, to open this. This is what we do. 
I mean, In-N-Out Burger does the same thing. You know, we got six things on the menu. We make burgers. You can have a cheeseburger, a double. We got a milkshake. We got some fries. You can have it kind of special, but that's all we do. We're not doing tacos. We're not doing chicken nuggets. Yeah, or like no one goes to Cheesecake Factory and complains that they have too many options, right? It's like no one's forcing you to try everything on the menu. Just choose what you want. So like if you don't want to read Morning Brew six days a week, you only want to open it once, then open it once. Yeah. But we made that decision very consciously. The same way we also made the decision. We were always like playing with the idea of what if you could choose your favorite topics are tech and crypto, hypothetically. So you would only get tech and crypto stories, not politics, not business, not federal interest rates or whatever else. And Neil came in and was like, that sounds cool and like techy and also like really complicated. But the value of Morning Brew is the content team knows better than the audience of what is like the finger on the pulse of what's happening in the world and what we think our audience is most interested in. So you're leaving the editorial decision to people who are in the weeds on Twitter and reading every business source possible of here's what our audience is most interested in. And it's a great example of like, I was never interested in politics, still not super interested in it, but I, there's a lot of politics stories that Morning Brew has covered that I've learned a lot from. And I would have, if I would have been able to choose like tech, SaaS, AI, whatever, I would have never seen those stories, but I've benefited in my life from be, getting exposure, which is the value prop of signing up to Morning Brewers. Mm-hmm. They know what their audience wants. Mm-hmm. And so I say that because while yes, you should always be receptive to user feedback, you have to be very careful of what your business model is, what the end goal is. And like, if you decide to allow your entire audience to cut back from daily to weekly, then there goes 80% of your impressions and then your ad dollars. And now you have a whole nother problem. So then take us from um, sort of the high point at Morning Brew. And when did you decide to leave and start this new venture? Yeah, so... Like I said, Morning Brew was a dream job. I had a ton of responsibility, a senior leadership team, figuring things out as I go. Um, did that for three and a half years. I joined when we were at like 50, 100,000 subscribers and grew to about three and a half million when I left. So amazing growth trajectory. Hired a few engineers, hired someone on growth, and then she had her own growth team. So everything was great there. Um, but at the end of the day, who I was building, pro- I also didn't know what product was. So like I was someone who understood the high level business objectives. I understood how to grow. I knew the engineering side and I was kind of tying it all together. And again, like my first corporate job, I didn't know product manager was at all. And then as I did more research, I was like, oh, that's what product is. It's understanding the marketing goals, the business objectives, communicating with the growth team, the marketing team, the engineering team, and like making sure everything gets done as expected and is hitting like the KPIs that you want. So I've kind of fell into this product role. But my core product I was building was like for the internal team. So the CMS that we built was for the content team. Mm -hmm. We built an ad management platform, which the sellers, the ad sales team, the copywriting team all use to manage the ad inventory. So again, custom built, really awesome opportunity to build that. But I was building for the sales team that I sat next to and the copywriting team. And then we had our growth team and we built dashboards. So at the end of the day, I was building tech for 40-ish people, like internal employees and some consumer-facing stuff in the newsletter and website. And after three and a half years, like that ecosystem was very robust, built out. The writing was on the wall that like we were legitimizing into like a 50-person plus company in the near future. And I not that I didn't want a boss, but I knew that there was going to be like incoming uh head of product coming in from Vice or Vox. Yeah, it's going to get more complicated. It was just going to be more of like, I love the three to 30 person company. Like that yeah. was exhilarating to me and there was no red tape and I was kind of calling the shots and doing what I wanted. And I learned a lot and got what I needed out of that experience. But the writing was on the wall that like I wasn't going to be on the senior leadership team forever and that they were going to bring in product managers from other media organizations. And me personally, maybe being stubborn, I was like, I don't really want to learn from a product manager at Vice or Vox. Like, yeah, that's cool. But like, one, I think I know this business better than anyone else they could bring in. And two, the media building tech for media and like the internal employees was cool. But like big tech and like software and SaaS was like really interesting, like building software for millions of people. Yeah. And actually, in your defense, I would say probably they did that to beef up their valuation if they had like an exit strategy putting a, you know, a big name adult on the uh, cap table or whatever they're going to do, you know, senior leadership in place was probably in preparation for a valuation boost. For sure. Potentially. Um, 
And yeah, again, like I'm, I have nothing against having a boss, but I yeah. just felt like from seeing what I saw from early days to where we are now, I knew that business inside and out where I was rough was like management and scaling a team. And like, yes, I've never managed a team of 30, 40 people before. And that's probably what they were looking for in the next evolution of growth. And fast forward, they're at like 250, 300 employees. So like, that's what they were obviously the trajectory that they were on and the people they needed yeah. to bring in. Guess what? You probably have handled it, but that wasn't your path. That that was, yeah, exactly. And like yeah. for, to their point, like it's kind of like there's different people for different stages of the business, which yeah. I think is the hardest part of a startup transitioning to a larger company. Yeah. I mean, Alex and Austin are tremendous leaders, but it was also their first time going through growing a company too. Yeah. And when advisors or investors are like, hey, you need to bring in this set of people, this skill set. I think it's very easy to just follow that advice and bring in those types of people yeah. to no one's fault. But like, that's just how it's been done previously. Yeah. And these investors and advisors have seen it done dozens of times. So they know better than they do and me and whoever else. Mm -hmm. So like, there's no fault there. I just kind of saw like what I could do there and my effectiveness was getting smaller and smaller. And the projects were improving the website a little bit, which is just like not as exciting to me. So I kind of knew that I was ready to try something different. My friend was, or my roommate at the time was working at Google. He's like, hey, there's a job that opened up at YouTube Music. I love music, have like a Spotify playlist. I have like, okay. I, I listen to music all day long. That's a big job, by the way. Yeah, so th this was Google my- gig, yeah. So- it was right at the beginning of COVID and he's, I was actually really interested in fintech. So I applied at all these big fintech companies, um, a lot that are pr pretty large now that I'm sure you've heard of. Mm -hmm. Rattle one or two. Uh, Ramp, okay. Brex, um, Pipe was one, like okay. all of these, like this whole new wave of like the 2020 cool fin fintech was hot. Mm -hmm. And I love tech and I love financial stuff. I was super into Robin Hood and investing. It was the first time I had like a little bit of disposable income and was just like in the like day trading, like messing around. Yeah, no, everyone was excited. And it was just a cool time to like, and I, and then I, I just so happened being in New York, stumbled into like talking to the ramp co-founder when they were 25 employees. And I kind of saw like what I wanted to do next was be an early employee at a somewhat de-risk startup, like maximizing my return would be, mm -hmm. how do I get a little bit of equity in a company that's definitely going to, or what I think would be a unicorn. Yep. It's not so risky that it's like first five, 10 employees, yeah. but they're clearly on a growth trajectory. And so yeah. that's, those were like the kind of companies I was looking for. Mm -hmm. Didn't get any of those jobs. And I ended up applying to Google, got a job at YouTube Music, um, early COVID, never stepped foot in the Google office ever. Bummer. <laughs> Which is like part of the perk of, I think, working at a company like Google yeah. is, is one, like the cafeteria, the yeah. offices, the, the and community. then also, yeah. also just the space to like be able to stumble from one meeting to another and bump into like five of the smartest people you'll ever meet yeah. is like the pool of wanting to work at a company like Google. It was a winter in Brooklyn, cold New York. And I was in my tiny apartment working out of my room. And it I knew that I wasn't going to like big company culture, but it was the opportunity of seeing, I've already done it at three people to 30. What does it look like to join one of the largest, most successful tech companies to ever exist? And then also just giving myself a realistic assessment of now that I know what product is, I've done it where I make up my own rules for product of what gets us from point A to point B at Morning Brew. I don't actually know what it means to be a product manager in a real company, a real company being one that I'm not making my own rules. Yeah, it's got structure. It's got, yeah. Structure. And everyone always, like I talked to a few friends who are like recruiters and like Google is like the gold standard of product management. Oh, yeah, they have sure. a very well-defined process. You'll learn like what process means in product better there than anywhere else. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a career trajectory move. I was like, that sounds really awesome. To and how old are you at this time? Currently? No, at, oh, at the Google? Uh, 27, maybe. Okay. So I think like 23 to 27, I was yeah. morning brew, making my own rules, wild west, had success, some luck, some working very hard. Yeah. And then just like being, a, I'm 27 in New York, what's like my next move to make me as a person in my career more knowledgeable, more useful, more valuable to any organization? And I was like, let me get really good at product management. And I love music. And Google is a like, generational tech company. So let's go there to learn. No brainer. Did that. No, I, I, very early on, like every roadblock that I thought I would have of like, you know, very bureaucratic, very slow moving, 
clear pain points that you can't address because you don't have the budget or the buy-in or it's too many friction points. Yeah, but it's Google. But it's Google. Tyler, yeah. So it was, it was very cool to yeah. see one, the knowledge base. Like getting ramped up was a, one of the most fun things I've done because they're like, here's how YouTube works. And you just watch these tutorials and like the documentation and then being able to go into the code and just be like, that's like the coolest thing ever to see like how they're rendering videos in real time and like how they can identify song tracks playing in the background. And I was on the YouTube music team. So it was kind of the underground of like publishing rights and masters and, and everything mm -hmm. of like who gets paid. And so the team that I was specifically working on wasn't like the flashy YouTube app. It was more so this music was playing in the background of this video for 20 seconds. Mm -hmm. The publishing rights are owned by these few people. Yeah, and the music. person who was uh, listening or watching that video was in Canada. So the rights are different in that versus India versus Russia versus the U S yeah. so who gets that like three cents, um, but like multiplied by like millions and millions of views. And so that was like one really interesting of understanding how the music industry works, totally different set of problems, yeah. totally different pace. But what I'd say that I learned there, which is still applicable was the, what I went there for, honestly, the process. And so they had a very well-defined, like if you were going to launch a feature, you do a product requirement document. It's like 10 to 20 pages. It has the user journeys. It has wireframes. Yeah. User clicks on this. This is what happens. It's buttoned up. It's P0. This has to be there for launch. P1, like this would be nice. P2, nice to have. And then things that you launch knowing it's not perfect and then follow up with these 10 things. But everything, it's what I should have done for my CMS that I built that morning brew. Yeah. Like you should know every step, like you're going to do this tech, this piece, and this is how it's going to fit together. Yeah. And here's the end result. But I love it because you, you had dessert first, you know, and then later you had the meal. You learned yeah. how to eat the meal. That's awesome though. It's great. So I went there and like, they're like, oh, this is what a PRD is. And then your manager looks it over. He goes, that looks good. And then the next step is you hand that to an engineer. And the engineer does like a technical scoping, which is almost like a PRD, but here's the database tables we need. What here's does PRD stand for? Product the non -nerdy. Product requirement document. Okay. And the technical doc, I'm blanking on the acronym, but it's a technical scoping doc. It's like the equivalent of like, as the product person, here's how it should look, how it should work, what users should expect when they interact with it. The technical scoping is we need to add this road to the database, this this model, this controller, like this is actually what's happening to build your vision of the PRD. So there's like this two components to it. The engineer leading it builds the technical doc, shows it to the engineering team, they buy in. And then it's like, okay, now we have sign off from product engineering. Now we're going to build it. Yeah. That's like what I would call like process, which I never had at yeah. Morning Brew. And I learned it there. And you would think something as buttoned up in process as Google, like wouldn't be applicable in a startup, but like that's exactly how we launch every feature at, at Beehive is PRD, technical scoping doc, sign off by everyone, then build. Yeah. How uh, invaluable though, right? Like, um, <laughs> you, you were like this, uh, bull in a China shop released, but you didn't break anything at first. Then you get the formal schooling and you learn how to do it proper. Uh, and then that, you know, enables your startup to sort of hit the ground running. The, the 10,000 foot view of like how I'm able to communicate this now is like I went to Google for 10 months and got what I needed out of it and then applied those learnings to Beehive. Yeah. Which like the high level, that was the goal even going into Google is like, I know I'm rough around process and product management. I don't know what those things really are in an organization. Let me learn. I learned it as quickly as possible. I was effective. I could finish my work at 1 p.m. and, and do a PRD at Google. And I was like, okay, that's how that works. It works really well. And it works well at like a large scale where there's a lot of bureaucracy in process. Imagine five person, six person team of a startup. Like we could hypercharge this and make it so much more efficient. Yeah. And so that's kind of why we've hit the ground running so quickly at BI. But that's kind of my trajectory at, up until YouTube. And so your 10 months at YouTube, how did you know when that was the right time to step off? So Okay. So I, I skipped over a few things. I had a week in between Morning Brew and YouTube. A week. A week. It's just like a, a week off. I actually got COVID during this week. I was supposed to go to San Diego and like do like a normal thing, like relax and travel in between your okay. jobs. Because even when you take PTO, like, you know, you have emails and stuff waiting for you. Like you're not, I feel like you're only truly free either when you're retired or like in between jobs where you don't have anything to respond to. Yeah. So I was supposed to go to San Diego and enjoy that week off. Got COVID in New York. So couldn't travel. It's 2020. 2021. No, 2020. You're right. Um, 
And we always the inception of Beehive happened way back at Morning Brew because we would always get inbound from readers being like, your referral program is amazing. The newsletter is amazing. Can my team or organization use your tech? Or how did you build this? Because they were all hoping that we had an off-the-shelf solution to say, oh, we just use Platform X. Go use them for the referral program. Mm -hmm. Or this is the CMS we use. But the truth was custom-built referral program, custom-built CMS, custom-built ad management. Website was custom-built. Yeah. So like there wasn't like, hey, just use this. It was like, oh, that's we built that. Yeah. And you can't access it. Yeah. So I actually pitched to White Label what we built that morning brew to Alex and Austin and said, why don't everyone's asking us for this software? What if you just gave me three months and we made it so anyone can sign up and use our software that we built that morning brew, but rather being for our employees, it's for anyone, which is Beehive essentially. Yeah. And I didn't know that they were already going under like acquisition talks, but it's kind of hard to be like in the late, the eighth inning of an acquisition and be like, oh, we're actually now a SaaS platform. So I understand why they didn't want to do it. Plus a lot of media companies have tried to be a tech company and, and failed. So like risk adjusted, I understand like Morning Brew is working really well. Let's not be a SaaS company with our two person yeah. engineering team. Yeah. Which is being led by a person who's self-taught and never done a SaaS product before. So timing is everything. Totally get that. So that was the inception. And my, the first person I had ever hired, Ben, who's my co-founder now, was the most special engineer, like just smart, creative. I'd be like, hey, I think we could kind of build this. And he'd come back after the weekend with something 10 times better than the best thing I could have imagined. I go, that's so... And maybe it's just like limited experience in the professional setting, but I've worked with engineers in college and even at YouTube and Google. And I've never seen someone with like the output and drive and creativity of this person. And we'd always just talk like, wouldn't it be cool if we built this, but like for thousands of people to use, not just like our 20 coworkers. And so that was kind of the inception of like, there's something here. Substack just raised money at like a $650 million valuation. So like newsletters as a space and a medium was growing. There were signals there, yeah. And then the hustle got acquired, Morning Brew got acquired, Axios got acquired, um, Political later goes on to get acquired. So like there's a lot of like signals that there's incumbent players like MailChimp and Active Campaign, Campaign, like yeah. legacy, like email senders. Convert kit, whatever. There's a new are. wave of players coming in that are trying to innovate the email space. And then there was like me and Ben and Jake and like our background of like, here's a media company that actually used the tools that we built custom. And they grew from nothing to a $75 million acquisition in three and a half years. And like, I know every data point we collected, I know all of the hypotheses we had of this might work and it ended up being useless and not working or like this might work better and it working and being like, that's such an interesting insight that we built into our website or our dashboard or our tracking that like, we only know because we were doing it with our content team and our data team. Yeah. You're an inside man. So it just like the, the founder market fit saying it like mm -hmm. couldn't have felt better. Yeah. And so to fast forward to the week off, I got COVID and I'm just sitting in my room in Brooklyn and I'm like, what am I going to do for a week? Can't really go outside. Can't travel. I was kind of pissed off. I wasn't in San Diego. And I called Ben, I go, we've always talked about building like a kind of like productizing morning brew and building out the tech there. What if we just built that and we had a few calls you brought in jake who he went to school with he's our third co-founder and i don't we mapped it out and he goes dude it's a lot of work like that's like pretty <laughs> damn ambitious to build out like a whole email platform to do everything like morning brew took us five engineers and three and a half years and not only do you want to do that but you want to make it a platform that anyone could just sign up and start using on their own yeah so we kind of mapped it out and that was kind of the start of it in the end of 2020 and then when did you officially launch? So Beehive was a weekend and night project while they were working at Morning Brew. I was working at Google, separate computers, separate everything. Of course, of course. And just kind of like working late at night. I actually feel terrible. They were like in Costa Rica for like a month long to kind of work remote. And typically, you know, you work your job, close your laptop, enjoy like being in a different country. But I was like, no, like I see the vision here. Like mm -hmm. you need to work. Like we, we need to yeah. hustle. Let's go. Um, so we did that for about 10 months. Pretty much the whole time I was at Google, I was kind of like hustling on this on like the weekends. Yeah. And eventually we, I raised money in July. We got a seed round put together. From? Social Leverage is our lead. Okay. Um, they're in like uh, San Diego. How much did you raise? We raised two point six okay so not a lot but enough to kind of give you a little 
first infusion. Yeah. So everyone always talks about entrepreneurs as being like the most like risk tolerant, like risky type of people. I did this in the most de-risk way possible because at the time, still very young in my career, still have a ton of debt. Yeah. I can't just not make money and live in New York or LA and build a company. And like our company required software vendors that are like an annual contract of $80,000 a year. Like I'm not fronting that. Yeah. So we raised money in July. The second the money hit the bank account, put my two weeks in, um, started early August full time at Beehive. They joined, I think a few weeks later. So this is August, September of 2021. We build, it's me, Ben and Jake, the co-founders. We brought on um, Andrew Placken as like our initial CTO. And so it was us four just grinding and building. And then we launched November of 2021. Yeah. I mean, so roll it over. Basically you started in 2022 and here we are halfway down with 23. I mean, we're talking just 18 20, months. 18, 20 months. Yeah. 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 And what do you got to show for that? So about four or $500,000 a month in revenue right now. So the MRR, M- magical acronym that we love. Yeah. Well, so it's different because we have our, most of our revenue is like the software SaaS. So we're at like three and a half million MRR right now, but we also have an ad network, which is like the big bet that we're making that we can help different newsletters and publishers and content creators get high quality advertisements without needing a whole sales team to do that. Yeah. So that's a holy grail. Talk about that. How does that work? So I guess like just to put everything back to, there's a few different ways to look at it. Going back to Morning Brew, we made money from ads. And so one of the largest teams at the company was the sales team. Yeah, they had to go out and-, and They had to go to Masterworks dollars and, and go to Apple, yeah. MasterCard, whatever, and say, he, we have an audience of three and a half million people. We've done surveys. They are between 24 and 26 or 28, household income, 300,000, likely to buy these types of products. Here's the case studies of other brands we've worked with. But there's a lot of assets, there's a lot of selling, a lot of relationship building. Yeah. And you're basically convincing Apple to give you five hundred thousand dollars to yeah. have their logo in your newsletter. Yeah, it's for a grind. Three or four different cents. It's tough. It's it's really hard. But there's constant surveying, understanding who your audience is. Yeah. It's not Facebook where they have every data point in the world. It's email where it's like an email comes in, they click on a few links, but like you don't really know who that person is, where they live, what they're interested in, how much money they make, what products they they're likely to buy. So it's a very opaque medium and their whole job is getting in front of brands that are willing to spend $60,000, $70,000 for a single email send to have their logo in the newsletter in the hopes that there's an ROI that all of our readers were to click on it, buy their product, use yeah. brand awareness. What, what's the ROAS that they're expecting? Is it like a 4X? Is it like a 10X? It's a good question. I, I, I actually don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's tough and it's also like very, and so flipping it onto the brand side, Let's say I am Brooklinen and I know that women in their 30s are likely to buy our pillow product that we're rolling out. Mm-hmm. If you want to advertise, you go to Facebook, go to Instagram, go to Google, like those are standard. If you want to try email newsletters, because you know that's a successful channel, you have to then find newsletters who have that demographic of women in their 30s. So now your growth marketers, like where does that exist? Like I think the scam might fit that. So like let's reach out to the scam. You go to the skim, you go to their ad sales team, they book you for two months down the line and you pay $50,000 to get in front of their list. So that's like a gamble. Like you don't know if it's going to work. It's a big upfront payment where like, you know, Facebook and Google, you can kind of turn the knob, turn it up and down. And so you're doing a bulk pay upfront for a send with no guarantee of results. And let's say it goes amazing. Then you can book another one two months out and you're like, let's find other newsletters like the skim. Like where does that exist? So now you're just doing research. You're reaching out to all these like weird newsletters that exist somewhere on the internet that you found off of a list. And you're like, hey, we want to advertise. And like, okay, our audience is this and household income is 100K. And you have no idea where they're getting those numbers from. You're just trusting and you're like, our open rate's 35%. And I think like 2% click through rate. And you're like, okay, I guess we'll give you $10,000 and yeah. see if this works. Let's roll the dice. But it, it's very opaque. It's very like trusting the publisher or newsletter. Like there's no guarantee and it's an upfront spend. And so that's kind of both sides. On the newsletter side, it's a grind to get these brands in front of you. Mm-hmm. On the marketing and brand side, it's really hard to find the newsletters that make sense and would resonate and convert. Yeah. Oh, and, and then the sure things like, you know, I, I'm sure everyone would love to advertise on Tim Ferriss's podcast, but guess what? It's like $100,000 a pop. And I'm sure it's worth every penny, but it's like not every advertiser can, av- you know, can afford that kind of bankroll. It's like, 
You can see the big ones, but you can't find the little splinter. And people want that, like Tim Ferriss, for example, for two reasons. One is the size and reach. Like it's a massive podcast. And two, like the influence. People hear what he recommends and they trust it and they convert a lot. Yeah. It's hard to get the size aspect, but there's so many other niche communities and creators where people and their audience do lean in and listen and trust their recommendations. Yeah. But it's harder to find those because they don't have the reach and the size. Yeah. And so what the value prop that we're trying to provide is if you have a 20,000 person list, cause you're amazing about writing sp- about sports, you grew to 20,000 people because you're an incredible sports writer, not because you know how to do brand advertising and sales and monetization strategies. So how do we allow you to keep writing about sports? Cause that's what you're amazing at and allow us to help you monetize. And on the brand side, Again, going to Brooklyn, and if you want to get in front of women in their 30s, because that's where your audience is most likely to convert, we, you can come to us, and we know based on the first party data that we're collecting, like best in class, because like some newsletter operators don't know what data to collect, how to collect it, what to ask for. We can tell Brooklyn, and we have 8,000 newsletters that the majority of the audience is women in their 30s, and we can get you in front of them and diversify your spend. Mm -hmm. So it's better for newsletters because they're getting inbound ad opportunities from brands they probably can't get in contact with or it's difficult or it's not a core competency. And we can go to brands and say, we can target the people that you want across our network of newsletters based on all of our first party data. And it really is at scale, like a win, win, win that we are trying to build. And that that's like the holy grail. Okay. So how do you access the ad network from, is it like on the dashboard? Like it's already built in, it's baked in there. Depending on when this podcast launches, it will be in the dashboard, but coming soon. Okay. Yeah. That's exciting. It, it, that is the holy grail. I mean, Everyone wants to monetize. Uh, these days, it seems like, you know, organic growth is great, but like you've got to pay to play a little bit. You've got to pay to grow the, the, the base. And it's nice if some sort of, you know, monetizing can help offset those costs, you know? Well, email already is so cost effective. And I mean, again, going back to the Morning Brew example, there was a point where there's five of us and we were sending to 500,000 people probably bring in two, three million dollars in like runway for a year of revenue. Yeah. And it was someone selling, someone doing the tech, someone growing, someone writing, and then someone doing the operations. We had a five person business. Granted, they had broader and more ambitious goals to get like venture like returns. But we could have been a five person shop and brought in three, four million dollars in revenue. And that's not even including if we launched courses or educational products, but just from the ads. And that small operation, because from the writing side, like the bare minimum, if there's a writer who's going to spend three hours writing stories for a newsletter, whether you send it to one person or one million people, like that writer's work is the same. So it's a very fixed cost in in terms of time and effort. Um, And so our job is to make those other things easier. The monetization part, so you don't need the sales team. The Mm -hmm. growth part, so you don't need the growth team. The tech part, so you don't need the tech team. And so if you are amazing at writing at whatever you care about writing about, the fact that we should be able to abstract at a very high level, the tech, the growth, the monetization, so you can focus on reaching your audience, like that is like the holy grail value prop of what we're doing to these newsletters. What's the um, what's the average value of an email subscriber? So like if I'm talking to an advertiser, let's make it easy math. Okay, I have 10,000 subscribers. Uh, what What should I be charging per... It's a classic, like, it depends, right? So, like, yeah. is it broad business news where you uh, me, don't... Okay, I'll give you a case study. Um, mm. He's a dentist. Uh, he's out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, he is uh, very popular with his local group, but he has some people coming in internationally to see him. And um, it's dental-focused, but it's a healthcare, health and wellness kind of uh, newsletter. Yeah, so the fact that you hit on, like, a niche... It, it You just work your way backwards from like everything's advertiser and brand driven. So, for example, if the product and the advertiser is HubSpot or Salesforce, one conversion on like an enterprise plan for them is worth maybe a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in annual revenue. Yeah. So they're willing to spend a lot of money to get in front of an audience of 20, 30,000 people who might be decision makers at businesses and startups. Because paying $50,000 up front to hit 50,000 people, hypothetically, one purchase and you have a part- positive ROI is incredibly impactful. So that's why the niche and audience matters a lot. So in that example, 
working backwards of like who are the potential advertisers in that scenario is it people and companies who sell high exp- high ticket expensive dental equipment to dentists to install in their office because if that's the case let's use a b2c as an example so maybe it's like um other relatable health and wellness products let's say um have you seen that red light therapy yeah it's super cool like sometimes it's portable um so let's say it's like a little red light therapy portable thing and maybe the retail cost on it is like $99, right? So here's the dental list. You've got the $99 product. You know, what should the owner of the newsletter be charging that little product for that space? Yeah. Uh, so like on the CPM basis, which is what newsletters like, so it costs per mill is I guess like the three primary advertising models or like cost methods are CPM, yep. which is cost per thousand impressions. Yep. There's CPA, cost per acquisition, which is only paying when a conversion actually happens. And then CPC, which is a cost per click. And it's like a sliding scale of who's more incentive, like who benefits the most. Yeah. Give me an average. I won't hold you. I know yeah. that it depends, but like give us. I was more so just breaking down for the audience. Like, yeah. cause like it changes in like the cyclical nature of the ad market. So CPM is amazing for newsletters because it's, we have a hundred thousand people. We charge a $10 CPM. Okay. So you're getting a thousand dollars every time you, like to, to monetize and pay in our newsletter, you're paying us a thousand dollars upfront. That's what we did at Morning Brew. That's what a lot of newsletters do. Brands want CPA because they're only ever paying when someone converts and buys their product. Right. Totally de-risk. We'll pay you $100 every time someone purchases our, our, our like right. in that example. Maybe if the product's $100, they're like, we'll pay you $50 every time someone purchases this product. So they're de-risked if they get... So it's performance-based, yeah. Performance-based. And then CPC is like the happy middle ground where it's like, we don't know if it, what's going to convert on your website. Like you might have a terrible landing page. Um, so we'll just pay you for how many people you drive to our landing page, which is CPC. What you're getting at is like the D to C performance, like direct response. They're much more analytical and seeing that return on ad spend. And so for a newsletter, a much bigger pain in the ass to be able to deliver because they have like a shorter span of like, we need to see results or we're moving on to another channel. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of newsletter operators are going niche media and like why HubSpot bought, um, the hustle, right? Because, all they need is one conversion and they are they are good for a foreseeable future in terms of like ROI. And so that's why the dental example is actually pretty interesting. If you have 10,000 people who are dental professionals who a lot own their own practice and then you have high ticket equipment in the dental space, yeah. if you're getting in front of people and they trust this publication and one person decides like, hey, I'm going to actually... Uh, renovate our entire office with or your buy a dental chair for Done. 10 grand. Yeah. So are you recommending, or h- how do you recommend the newsletter owner, writer, um, sender negotiate these deals? I mean, it, it does depend. Like, is it performance based? It depends on like who the advertiser are, who, who the advertiser is. If it's Mercedes Benz and all I got to do is sell one Mercedes and that's like a $65,000, you know, uh, payday, then yeah, I understand that. But like for everyone else that is maybe going on the CPM model, is it like, you know, 50 cents per subscriber or is it like a dollar or two dollars per su- subscriber? You came out with that $10 the, CPM. This, the CPM would be what we've seen traditionally. So that's like industry, between, you know, $10 CPM is pretty normal. Or? I'd say like 20 to 50 is like a pretty common range of a, a okay. CPM, depending on how niche your target is. If okay. you're like very in the dentist example, you can probably get up to a hundred, two hundred dollar CPM. Right. Yeah. And I'd also say CPM varies on, is it your list size or just the people who are opening? Cause a subscriber might not open. So a 10,000 person list with a 50% open rate, and we would always go back and forth at other companies at Morning Brew and elsewhere of do you charge based on people who are opening or like the list size? Because technically, if they don't open, like that's not an impression. And yeah. they don't even know that Mercedes is the advertiser in your yeah. newsletter. Um, so it depends. Yeah. I guess ultimately the advertiser wants results. You know, the, so care. it depends on what game you're playing, right? If you are trying to build long lasting relationships with these advertisers, like you want to deliver as much return for the advertiser as possible. And then as the newsletter operator, you want to be able to sell the vision of why they should advertise. So like mm-hmm. you, there's, people always ask like, how big does my list need to be before I start monetizing? 
I toss out like 10K sounds like a, a good round number where it at least interests advertisers to say that's enough people that if we can get 5% conversion, 2% conversion, yeah. that would move the needle a bit for us. But it's all about selling the narrative of like why that audience is more valuable than advertising on another channel. Yeah. And the example is if you are, if you have a market or a newsletter that speaks to 10,000 decision makers at a series A, series B startups, and you know that for a fact from like the surveying that you've done, and you know that you have a hold on and an influence over these people, like that's very valuable. And the alternative of going to Google or Facebook, like how do you target decision makers who run orgs, like product orgs at an A and B stage company on Facebook? And the answer is like, you probably don't hit that audience too reliably. Yeah. So it's, it's a conversation about exclusivity or access or, you know, all these things I understand. So then it it just makes me curious, how are you going to do that with the ad network? So how do you establish the, the value? How do you work that out? How do you reconcile that within the SaaS program? So what you give up in working with the ad network is the narrative telling of like, this is exactly who our audience is. And if the odds are just by nature of the network, like you will get a better rate if you're out in market negotiating yourself, what you're getting by working with us is the fact that you don't have to do that work. Yeah. You sit, you're writing your newsletter. And that is a lot of work. You're writing your (laughs) newsletter to your 10,000 dental professionals about what's hot in the dental industry. What are different trends? What are different studies? And as you're writing, you see an inbound opportunity from Crest come in and they're paying you $40 CPM and you can press one button, add it to your newsletter, and then we'll send you a wire for $3,000 a few weeks later. And you didn't know, you don't know anyone at Crest. Yeah. You didn't do any work. You didn't do the copywriting. You aren't reporting. You aren't doing any of the tracking. You just press the button, you added it. And our bet is the value we provide in being able to bring you advertisers that are relatable to your audience because we're only giving you average, we only gave you Crest because we know that your inter- like your audience is yeah. dental focused. Because at the end of the day, our customer is Crest at this point too. Yeah, we need to make sure they see a po- positive ROI. So we're bringing advertisers to newsletters that make sense, and you just got paid for doing kind of nothing, which is really yeah. the value prop of what we're trying to provide. Yeah, and by the way, you can do a hybrid of that. You can go out and seek and try to find your own deals and you can do the internal. And we don't do exclusivity. So if yeah. you have a relationship and like you are influential in the dental space and you know people at Crest and, and whatever other companies, you can do those deals. And it's not because you're on our platform. We don't allow you to do those ads. At the end of the day, we work backwards from we want all of the newsletters to make money and grow and succeed. Yeah. And we're building tools to help facilitate that. And if you can find ways to make money or grow faster with other tools or your own relationships, like we don't restrict that in any way. We're just trying to be additive. Yeah. It sounds like you're trying to take all the pain points out of it. Like that's where you're att- attacking. We know the pain points. We've seen the pain points. I've sat next to teams that were dealing with pain points yeah. and we're just building tech to help facilitate those and, and make it easier. So people can create content that they want to create. They can build a business around it. They can monetize, they can grow, they can grow influence. And we do the annoying, boring stuff that they don't feel like doing, and they get all of the upside. Uh, what are some of the other surprising things you've discovered about growth from doing this that may not be intuitive? Growth for the newsletter, growth yeah. for the business? Uh, either. Um, yeah, I think people are getting really creative with how they're distributing their content. And so chopping up their content, putting themselves behind, like, or in front of a green screen and doing it on shorts and TikTok and reels, like... I think partnerships is another big thing. So finding content creators, influencers in your space, it's not really like there's like a silver bullet. It's just how much work are you willing to put in to finding where your ideal audience lives and how do you get in front of them? So driving people to your newsletter via other social networks. Sure. Yeah. Like any, because at the end of the day, like you need distribution. And yeah. so if you're more popular on LinkedIn and you post your newsletter on LinkedIn every day, yeah, then that's just more impressions that hopefully funnel into your newsletter. Um, there's like things that are repeated, like referral program, there's SEO. So constantly putting out good content that indexes on Google. Yeah. There's pop-up forms to collect visitors, to convert to subscribers. Do pop-ups still work? I mean, they're yeah. annoying, but yeah. yeah, they work surprising. And like you can get, we have something that's even like more aggressive than pop-ups, which is like email gating your entire post. So if you were to have like a really interesting title, not maybe clickbait, but ideally not, and people click into it but they actually can't read the content unless they put in their email. So it's like kind of like a pop-up of pop-ups you can exit out of this. Like if you want the content, you have to subscribe. So that's effective. 
Um, there's the recommendation network that we built where you can recommend other newsletters. They can recommend you. So every time you sign up for a newsletter, you can see the five newsletters that they're reading or that's, recommending. That's really smart. So yeah. that's like a network effect type play that works really well. And then we launched a feature called Boost, which is that on steroids where you can just put paid spend behind it more or less. So you could say, I'm spending $5 per lead on Facebook or Instagram or whatever to grow my email list. I'm willing to pay $3 to anyone on Beehive to help drive me subscribers. So you set your CPA at $3. Every newsletter on Beehive can see that and say, I'm growing by 1,000 subscribers a week. If I push 2% or 5% to you and I'm getting $3 kicked back to me for every subscriber, then it's just network effects with people who are willing to pay. Yeah. Um, so there's a, like a lot of fun things like that, that building the platform and building these networks kind of help everyone grow quicker and more efficiently and again like we have the data on all of this so like over time we can get better at recommending newsletters we can get better at what advertisers to, to show to different newsletters we're collecting data on like the readers in terms of what they're clicking on maybe someone's only clicking on yahoo finance and cnbc and nba so we know that they are interested in finance and investing and sports and basketball and so when we try to figure out an advertiser who makes sense we can kind of group those together um, so it's, I think, really exciting. That's why I think we're like in the early days of this. Okay. So uh, that's amazing. Uh, you recently got another infusion of cash. You got like a $12 million. Uh, 12 and a half from Lightspeed. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. But you've done all this stuff. It just feels like you're just getting started. Yeah. I mean, working backwards from where we just left off of like the grand vision, like we're, so, we're first inning of where I think this can go. And so the analogy that I always use is like MailChimp sold for $12 billion and they just send emails. And I think what we're building is so much more powerful and ambitious on top of just sending emails. There's network effects, there's growth, there's monetization, they're sending emails better and like mm -hmm. a bunch of other data plays there. So I think we're so early, which is I tr I can't think about the grand vision after like 8 p.m. because then I don't sleep. Mm -hmm. But we have a really talented team. We have a pretty well-defined roadmap of at least the next 12 to 24 months. And I, I get really excited about what we're in the process of building. So this series is called Behind the Brand. Uh, let me let you weigh in on what is the definition of a brand? And then the second part is what is the beehive brand great questions um to me brand is i mean it can be so many things right it's the value that you provide your audience it's reliability so you go to apple and whenever apple releases a product you kind of know what to expect um and so that's because of the brand there's like a quality and expectation built into it and there's the community behind it as well as like another aspect. And so when I think of the Beehive brand, I think what we've done well to date is cultivate a really engaged community and working backwards from that. It's because we're very customer obsessed, user obsessed. I think like what I was describing earlier of everything that sucks about scaling a newsletter from brand deals, advertising, reporting, data, growth, understanding where readers are coming from. Like our job is to identify everything that sucks about this process to our users and make it better and or remove it altogether. And, and we would own that. And thinking through that lens, it's it really is my day to day is finding pain points and then finding the solution to remove those pain points from our users. And I think it's shown to whether it's on Twitter, LinkedIn, podcast, how obsessed we are with solving our users problems. And when everything you do from the customer support to the product releases to what we are productizing and prioritizing as a business all goes back to helping them and making their lives better, that's like the messaging that we're trying to convey to the market. And I think people resonate a lot with that. Um, and then it's just kind of like the, the subject matter expertise of we leaned in early because we didn't have anything else. Of we built Morning Brew back in the day. And like yeah. we are kind of replicating that now, but in a new form. And so there's a lot of legitimacy and subject matter expertise built into you could use any software vendor. Traditionally, a lot of the email vendors are a cost to you. Like you go and you pay them $500 a month to send to 40,000 people. We want to be a net revenue income for you where 
rather than paying us, you might pay us $99 a month, but through boosts, through subscriptions, through ad network, you're actually making four or $5,000 from our software. And as long as we can be in the black for our users, it's value additive in their life. And, and that's what we're trying to nail as a brand. I mean, we were just sitting back, you know, <laughs> chopping it up, reminiscing about the good old days and all that, <laughs> you know, tracking my roots, where I came from and where I'm going.